what variables you might want to look at. But that's really straightforward. And we do all of this using these. And I won't dwell on this too much, but anybody who's followed my Twitter account will have probably seen it up there, up there at some point. And you can always get in touch with me and, and you know, email me or, or get hold of me via Twitter and I can more than happy to pass this on. This is a relatively, um, I'm going to say idiot proof. The reason I say idiot proof is because I've developed it for my first year sports science students. <laughs> and, I, and I think most of them get it. Now, that isn't meant to sound as patronising as it probably did. But what I mean is that actually, if you're, if you're, look, every object, whether it's an individual or a sporting implement, will have inertia. If it's moving, okay, then it's defined by its mass. Oh, sorry, if it's not moving, it's defined by its mass. But if it's moving, it's defined by its momentum. And we know that momentum is directly proportional to the impulse that we apply. And all the impulse is, is force multiplied by the change in time. So how hard you push or pull something and how long you push or pull it for. And they're two really useful qualities. Free, if you include the velocity component of velocity, uh, sorry, of momentum. Three really useful elements for assessing someone's neuromuscular capacity. Okay. The harder you push, the longer you push for, the greater your impulse will be. And as a consequence, the faster you'll move. But of course, most sports are typically constrained by time. So we ideally want our athletes to be able to apply as much force as they possibly can in a shorter period as they possibly can. So they're moving as fast as they can, whether that's to actually evade um, op an op opposition player or whatever. Very, very rarely are your athletes afforded the opportunity to take as long as they possibly can to apply force. So impulse for me is a really important metric. <laughs> Excuse me. Anything, any area but around the force time curve, so here, for example, or here, the area under the force time curve, that's the impulse. It's how hard the athlete has pushed against the, the ground in this case and how long they've pushed or pulled for. Okay. <clears throat> so what we can probably do then is start thinking of impulse as the effort we apply or the effort we're exerting and the time we exert it over and that will be directly proportional to how quickly and the direction that we'll move in all right so impulse momentum really really simple stuff it's often lost though and for some reason strength and conditioning practitioners particularly seem hell-bent on absolutely overwhelming themselves and overcomplicating this the bottom line is, if you push or pull something for a certain amount of time and it's sufficient to overcome that object's inertia, it will move. The greater the impulse you apply against it, the harder you push or pull, and the longer you push or pull against an object, the faster it will move, okay? Simple as that. And like I said earlier, ideally, this probably isn't gonna be the strategy we're gonna be encouraging our athletes to use. It's probably gonna be this down here. We wanna get them to the point where they can transmit as much force as they possibly can and apply as much force as they possibly can in the shortest possible time period. So let's think about some influencing factors. Just the last couple of slides to finish off and hopefully get you thinking a bit. Ideally, if you're already using force plates or you're seriously considering using them, start thinking about what metrics you can use. Most importantly though, think about why are you gonna use them? What do they actually tell you? Do you understand what that metric represents? And how can you use that to inform your day-to-day -day practice? Part of that practice should be developing or building a robust athlete model to try and gauge what they're currently able to do and where perhaps you need them to get to. So you can figure out that plan of attack to get them from point A to point B. And in the back of, the mind, back of your mind, you should always have why. Why am I doing this? Make sure Regardless of your level of understanding, make sure that you own your data. And there's nothing wrong with starting right at the bottom and thinking, okay, so I understand this concept. That's what I'm going to stick with from now. And then start building on that as you attend more of these webinars or come to see us speak or read journal articles or whatever. Whatever you can do to improve your understanding of this area, use it to take ownership of your data. You're responsible for it. Okay, so any decisions that you make, you should, be a hap you should be happy and comfortable uh, with your understanding underpinning those decisions. And so I like to try it now. I, I kind of stole the skeleton of this idea from John McMahon. And if anybody knows John McMahon, he's a really good guy, really bright guy, 
he doesn't mind sharing his knowledge and he puts this stuff really, really easily. Now, essentially, we want to report at least one kind of output metric. And these might include something like jump height, takeoff velocity or, or jump momentum, where jump momentum is simply the athlete's body mass multiplied by their, how quickly they're moving at takeoff. Um, one or two driver metrics, ideally, I would suggest. And what I mean by driver metrics are the kind of things that drive that performance. So typically, we're using a force plate, so let's start thinking about forces. Maybe the average force that's applied during the braking or propulsion phase. Maybe the force at the lowest displacement, so that marks that force as that transition from down to up. Try and support any driver metrics you use with strategy metrics. And what I mean by these are, Against, essentially, these gives us an insight into what strategy the jumper uses to get or to perform that particular type of movement. It doesn't necessarily necessarily mean to be in, uh, need to be intentional, but things like the braking time, propulsion time, or the total movement time. Indeed, we might start thinking about things like how far did the jumper squat down? Was it more than normal? Was it faster than normal? Okay, if the down displacement increases but the, the braking time decreases, then we know that the downward velocity has increased. So as a consequence, that negative impulse has increased. And so that will probably make them bouncier. And so they'll probably be able to jump much higher. Now, please take this in the spirit it's meant. But the final metrics we want to sort of consider are things like the fluffy metrics. These are the metrics that seem to be all over social media. Okay. They can be incredibly useful. Note, can be. You have a robust, a robust rationale for why you're using them. So you understand what they represent, you understand how they've been calculated, and you know what they're bringing to the table. Okay? Because variables like mean power, for example, isn't going to mean an awful lot if you're testing your, your athlete pre to post training intervention if they completely change their strategy. So there's no point in considering mean power if you don't consider some sort of strategy metric as well. So you've got to use a combination of these to tell the story. There is no magic bullet. Anybody who tells you there is a magic bullet is lying to you. Okay, trust me. Why would you trust me? You don't even know me, do you? If you saw me, you'd see I've got a trusting face. 